time. Coming from Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse number 4. Reading from the New King James Version. Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse number 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove the last man from his place. Unless you repent. This is what this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolosians, which I also hate. He who has an evil ear, let him hear what the maturity of all says to the church. Amen. To him who overcomes, I will give to each from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. 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 Father, I stretch my arms to yes, you. Yes, sir. No yes. other help than I have. If I don't draw myself from thee, Lord God, where else would I go on your way? Here we are again, once again, God, in a house where we can find grace and mercy, God. God, we can come to you, God, and lay it out like the altar, Father. Leave it there, Father God. God, we just bless you for this day. For this is the day that you are made. We are rejoicing and exceedingly glad in you, Father. From the rising of the sun to the dawn of the sun, God, you are worthy to be praised. Because you are the great I am, the lid of the battle, our bright and morning star. You are peace in the midst of a storm, Father God. And we will bless you, Lord, at all times, God. And our praise will shall be in our mouth, Father God. God, we come right now, Father God, just to continue to bless you, God. And thank you, God, for waking us up this morning in our right mind, giving us safe travel to this house, Father, and not to leave the Baptist Church, Father. Thank you, everyone that's represented here this morning, God. Bless every household we ever need. Touch every heart. God, we pray for our sick and our shadow, Father God. God, we pray now, God, for bereaved family, God. God, we thank you right now, God, for awesome home for our service on this day. Brother Thomas, Father God, we had a great time in the Lord, Father. We thank you so much for that, God. We just said to be absent from the body, to be present with you, Father. And come as made it over, Father. We thank you so much for that, God. We continue to pray for the enemies, God, and down God, and God, the Lord, Father. That you just come in the rock and the love of us, Father God. Because you are peaceful, God. You are loving, God, kind, God, patient, God. A God that speaks to us, Father. And that's deep and right and sin on this thing, God. You're not only a big time, God, but you're like watching the cross, Father. We thank you, God, that we come to you in the midnight hour, God. But we can't sleep, Father, and we lay it all on you, God. But we thank you so much for that. Now we lift up to you, the man of God, one of many people that there, Father. Man that labors for you, Father God, to take strength in God. Build him up, prop him up on that other inside. Go before him in the cooking pasture, Father, in the name of the Lord. Thank you, God, for being the Lord of the here today, God, the name of the town, God. Trust me for us today. We yeah. continue to pray that you just bless him, come and protect him, and keep him safe from all her home and there. Thank you for his loving wife, Father God, to stand by his side and pray for him and with him, God. We pray, God, for every family that's represented yeah. today, God. Even though they're not in the walking work, God. Bless him, protect him, and keep him. Father, we pray for his quiet and sin, Zion, so long as he only yeah. live. God, we thank you once again, God. Help us keep our hand on your hand, Father God. Your word says, Give him hand for the water, so I'll so thirsty, Father. Yeah. With the earthly God, we love the things that the earth and your word. We thank you so much for that. This is my prayer to Jesus Christ on the name we pray. And the Lord say amen. Amen. Amen.
the effort that you're willing to put in to make it known to someone that you're interested in them. And, and, and the whole aim, if you will, is to capture the heart, right, of one that you are pursuing. So, Pastor, how does that apply to us? I believe that every Christian ought to be engaged in personal evangelism. That, that's my conviction. I believe that every Christian ought to uh, have targeted people or people groups that they are trying to win their hearts for Jesus. Amen. And, and so Paul writes this morning really to remind the church at Corinth of how he pursued them for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and Paul said, I, 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 I know that you have this group uh, in, in, in Corinth known as the Sophists. These were the uh, sophisticated or sophisticated, whichever term you want to use. Uh, the, the, these were uh, the uh, eloquent speakers uh, who, who came and they said a whole lot of stuff. Um, but really, it was all about how it sounded, it, but it wasn't about the content. Paul, I know you're used to uh, hearing people who have verbal dexterity, uh, who, who like to impress you with how big of words that they use and, and, and try to persuade you. Let me tell you quickly, uh, a gentleman told this story. He said that no one should ever be convinced to be a Christian unless it's by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he said, we had this guy who came to our church and we prayed for him and we prayed for him and, and nothing ever happened. He said, then one day uh, he came to church and said, I want to be saved. And we said, what happened? He said, well, Dr. So-and-so came by the house and he would not let me leave until I made the confession. He said, so he just convinced me, he persuaded me, he twisted my arm into becoming a Christian. So to get him to leave, I said that I'll be saved and I'll come to your church. Well, guess what? It lasted about six weeks. Yeah. It's because someone had convinced him, had sold him on Christianity. And the point that Paul was trying to make this morning is that he was not a Christian salesman. He was a Christian ambassador. There is a difference. And it's right here in the text. I just want to uh, take a few moments. One of the first things that happens when you're trying to win, that you should do, uh, uh, when you're trying to win the heart of a person or people group for the Lord. Number one, you have to make sure of your approach. You, you have to pay close attention to your approach. Note here that Paul says in uh, verses 1 and 2, and when I came to you, when I approached you, Brethren, I did not come with superiority speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Uh, Paul says that I did not come to Corinth and try to impress you with my verbal dexterity. Paul said I didn't uh, make lofty speeches. Uh, it always amazes me that some of us are so locked into the version of the Bible that we read that it's hard for us to make application in context. You know, it's just difficult uh, for me to receive, DeAndre, someone in 2021 when you got all kinds of languages and you got Ebonics, right? Uh, and, and somebody's walking up to me talking about, listen, my brother, thou thus goest should know of the Lord. I mean, what you talking about? Just don't say it. Uh, don't be trying to impress me uh, with how much King James you got memorized, uh, but quit quoting scriptures at me and quantify why it is to my benefit to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, Paul, Paul says that uh, we need to understand and make sure that we choose substance over style. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I plead with young preachers, and I'm talking to Aaron even now, and saying that the preaching is literally true through personality. God, God knew who you were when he called you. Right. He didn't call you to be anybody else. Right. Don't try to be anybody yes, else. Sir. One of the things that was intimidating to me uh, when I was called to preach was I knew I couldn't do what I had been it, it wasn't my personality. It wasn't my character. And God laid it upon my heart. Preach the word. Amen. Preach from your own experience and understanding 
think of me based upon the word of God. Amen. In his book, Pulpit Crimes, you've got to read this if you have any interest in preaching uh, or how to, to reach people for God. In his book, Pulpit Crimes, uh, 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 the subtitle is The Criminal Mishandling of God's Word. Uh, uh, James R. White says this. He said that he had a reputation as someone who was, you know, somewhat familiar with the languages, with the Hebrew and the Greek. So a young preacher approached him and said, I want to preach this one day and understand the, the attitudes. And so he said, can you look this commentary over to me and make sure that it's accurate? He said, after careful study, looking into the languages, the tenses, and, and doing the exegetical work, he told the young preacher, he said, it sounds good. But it's not funny. Mm -hmm. Well, he said about three weeks later, uh, he saw on the program that the young preacher that he had helped out with his exegetical homework was going to preach. He said, so I decided to stay for that service. About, about five, six thousand people were there. He said, and to my, uh, 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 to my dismay, he literally got up and preached the commentary that he knew was not accurate to the text. He said, later on, I saw him in the hallway. He said, when he saw me, he just dropped his head. And he said, I know, I know, I know, I know it was wrong, but it sounded good. And, and that's what concerns me is so many people are interested in hearing something that sounds good and not that it is sound. I'm concerned. And so Paul said, I want you to understand that when I came to you, I was not looking to impress you. I was looking to make an impact on you. Amen. And, and no here, and no here. Uh, 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 we need to determine. Paul said, I made a determination. I made a decision. He said, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Paul said, I made my mind up that I was going to tell the gospel story. I made my mind up that I was going to preach the good news. I was going to tell you that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. I, 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 I determined that I was going to tell you that you had an outstanding debt that you could not pay and that Jesus paid it all with his blood. I determined to tell you you have no reason to fear now or the future because Jesus died was buried in the grave and rose for our justification. You have a reason to trust him because he has power over life, death, hell, sin, and the grave. Paul said, I was determined to preach the good news to you and him crucified. Nobody really wants to talk about a crucified Jesus. I noticed that. Everybody wants to talk about the Jesus that you can call like a genie when you need him. Everybody wants to talk about the Jesus that you can present your wish list to. But nobody wants to talk about the suffering servant that Isaiah talked about. That he was wounded for our uh, transgressions and was bruised for our iniquity. That, uh, that all of the, uh, of the debt and the weight of our sin was placed upon him. And by his strength that we are still. Can I tell you something? If you are going to experience salvation, you must understand the suffering of the Son of God. Amen. 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 D.A. Carson says it this way, when the pressure to contextualize the gospel jeopardizes the message of the cross by inflating human egos, the cultural pressure must be ignored. Amen. Paul, Paul said, I had one thing in mind. When I came to you, I was not there to impress you. I was not there to woo you with big words and try to come off as I was deep or heavy. But Paul said, I determined to preach Christ, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. In, in golf, you know, I don't know if there's any golfers in here, and let me be real clear, I'm not one. I just like to play. There is a, uh, a, a shot or, or stroke in golf called the approach shot. And, and that's when you get towards the greens, where the flag is, where the cup is. 
And a friend of mine was telling me the story about getting an opportunity on a Thursday to observe Tiger Woods at the Masters back in the day of, of, of practicing during his practice round on Thursday. And what he noticed, he said, you know, the thing that threw me off was everybody else on their approach shot was hitting the golf ball where the flag was, trying to get as close to this ball. Tiger was hitting it 20 feet away. He said, and, and, and he did it. Uh, so many times I realized that it wasn't an accident he was doing it on purpose. He said, so later on they were interviewing him and said, Tiger, everybody else is practicing uh, to hit the ball where the existing uh, flags are, but you're hitting uh, it 20 yards away. And they said, why is that? He said, well, on Sunday morning, the flags will be placed where I'm hitting at. Uh, you missed it, see? He, he, said, he said, see, I'm not playing for Thursday. I'm playing for Sunday morning. And, and, and that's all I'm trying to tell you is that don't get so caught up uh, uh, in the moment that you could get permission. But Paul's saying that if, if, if you're really going to go after the hearts of people for God, then you have to go where God is working. Uh, you, you have to understand that you have to look beyond all the deflection, all the excuses, and get to the heart of the matter and go after people's heart. You have to be uh, aggressive and, 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 and here's the biggest part of it is that you have to understand that God is working in you to do uh, and to will of his good pleasure. So you don't have to force the gospel on you. Secondly, if you're going to win the hearts of a people group or a person, you, you got to have the right attitude. It's right here in verses 3 and 4. Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in my strength. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words, wisdom, but in the demonstration of the power and of the spirit. Now let me be real clear about something. If you read Paul, who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, Paul's not done. <laughs> so so Paul, Paul is not advocating irresponsible exegesis. That's not what he's advocating. But Paul is not advocating sloppy preaching. Uh, Paul is not saying dumb down the message. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that anything that you say or do with the aim of impressing people and not bringing them to the cross, you need to get that out the mess. That's all he's saying. He said, he said listen, I, and again, I advocate for preachers to learn as much as you can. Do you hear what I'm saying? But, but when you go into the laboratory, and when you go into time of preparation, you work like everything depends on you. But then you pray like it all depends on him. That, that's all I'm saying. But read, read Paul, three fourths of the New Testament. Read Galatians. Read uh, Romans. Read First, Second Corinthians. Uh, uh, read Acts. Uh, excuse me. Read, read uh, uh, Colossians, Ephesians, the Philippians. Uh, read First and Second Thessalonians. Read the epistles, and you'll understand. This man is no light one. But Paul said, when I am preaching the gospel, I'm not preaching my resume. I'm preaching redemption. I, 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 I'm not trying to impress people with uh, the fact that I can speak the language or understand the languages or the schools that I've gone to. I'm trying to impress upon them that God loves you and God has proven his love to you through the sacrificial death of his son. And God raised him from the dead for you to understand it wasn't an illusion. It wasn't a real thing. Amen. Papa says, in humility, weakness, and in much trouble, Humility recognizes the dependability of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I uh, I first started preaching. I've been preaching a couple of years, and I was talking to my pastor at the time, Elder Wilford Banks Jr. Um, at um, Good Hope Baptist Church in Wheatley, Arkansas. We is the only town I know of the small and power. And, and so I said to El Banks, I said, Pastor, every time I get up to preach, I'm just nervous. He 
He said, when you stop getting nervous, you need to stop preaching. Right. That's exactly right. He said, see, That's now right. you can walk into the pulpit That's on right. a cavalier like you got it all together and you don't need the Holy Spirit. He said, That's the day you need to quit preaching. Right. He, he said, see, that nervousness is a sign that you understand it's his gospel, not yours. <laughs> that, that, that nervousness is an indicator that you understand that you need the power of God. Now, let me make application here. You don't need just the, the power of God just to preach. Uh, you need the power of God to go to that job you got to go to tomorrow. You need the power of God to raise children. You need the power of God to protect your marriage. You need the power of God to live in this cutthroat culture. You need the, uh, the power of God to deal with the backstabbers. You need the power of God to deal with the haters. Uh, Paul said, listen, when I came to you, I came in fear and much trouble. That's right. Paul recognized that I need the Holy Spirit. Right. If, if, if I'm going to stand in this sacred space and, and, and fulfill this sacred assignment and impact the generation for God, I can't do it in all power. So I'm nervous, Andre. Every time I get up, will I say something that will cause people not to see Jesus? Uh, we, we have to be careful. Don't let my reputation become a distraction for people to see Jesus. Come on. Amen. Paul understood. He wrote it to the church in Philippians uh, uh, 2, 12 and 13. He said, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. It is God that worked in you to will to do his good right? Here's what Paul is really saying. I believe it's uh, it, it, it's uh, Professor Bird in his systematic theology from the evangelical perspective writes this about sanctification. He says sanctification is the external response to the internal change. So Paul is saying here, when we become sanctified, set apart for God's use, he said something's happening on the inside that begins to manifest itself on the outside. And through the inner conviction of the Holy Spirit that's telling me that I am growing in him and he expects me to bear fruit, there's a sense of anxiety there on the human side that I'm handling something that's almost like nitroglycerin. And I need to be careful how I handle God's word. I need to be careful that I'm not elevating my personality and not the principle. I need to be careful when people walk out the building that they're talking about Jesus and they ain't talking about me. I need to be careful that when I preach the gospel that people come to lean and depend on Jesus that I'm making Christ followers and not preacher followers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Warren Richby says this about verse 4. Uh, look at verse 4. Paul says, in my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. One word says Paul's preaching was a demonstration, not a performance. Some of y'all missed that. A lot of churches are struggling in the pandemic because in some churches it was about the performance and not the demonstration of the spirit. Can I say it again? Y'all ain't gonna run me out. Uh, uh, a lot of churches are struggling in pandemic because it was about the performance that was taking place on Sunday morning and not the demonstration of the power of God's spirit. Amen. This word uh, demonstration is translated and means uh, legal proof presented in a court of law. You know, testimony. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you just can't be going around making accusations. Uh, you can't just bring somebody up on charges because you're mad. Because <laughs> at some point, the, 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 the judge is going to say, uh, please present the evidence. Or please present the proof. Yeah. Now, this is where it gets to that. Paul testifies to the church in Galatia that when we preach in Syria, 
He said the people kept saying, the man who once persecuted the church yeah. is now preaching it. Paul said, my life is a demonstration of the gospel. Y'all yeah. missed that. Yeah. Paul said, when I first started preaching and I was down around Syria uh, in that area, he said, people were saying, look, you got to come to church Sunday morning. You got to come to the revival uh, on Wednesday night because this brother named uh, Saul, who now named Paul, this is the man who used to persecute the church and now trying to destroy the church, uh, who were persecuting the church and was trying to destroy the church. He's now preaching the gospel, and this is what Paul said. People, Paul said, and people start glorifying God because of me. Amen. That's a testimony. See, 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 see. When you're going to try to tell somebody about Jesus, they first need to see some proof in your own life that Jesus has done something for you. So they, they, they need to see. Uh, is there anybody here who understands uh, that the proof of the gospel has changed lives? Are there any demonstrations in here today? Is, is there any, are there any demonstrations in here? Is there anybody here who your real testimony is that God picked me up out of the muck in the mire place? and back 
God. You don't realize and recognize that Jesus died for the sin of the world. He didn't die for a few people's sins. He died for everybody's sin. And I know your Bible, uh, you got that new translation. Mine says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yours says y'all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I stopped out this morning to tell you that Jesus is the reason why we preach. That Jesus is the only one that can say that Jesus is the only priest that ever offered up an atonement sacrificial offering to God and didn't have to offer another one. One time, last of all, he offered himself. Then he sat down at the right hand of the Father, my Bible says. And guess what? The Bible says, and now he intercedes daily for us. See, anybody here who understands that your aim needs to be, tell people about Jesus.
Hey! 